second angel, poured out his vial on the sea, and it became blood. Now, you notice some of these plagues had all been brought by the judgments of God on the kingdom of the Antichrist during the tribulation, during his rule and reign. But they were only partial at that time. A third was destroyed. A third of the waters became blood. A third of the trees were burned up and so on. Remember? This time, it seemed to be almost total. Horrible. It says the sea became blood. Apparently all the sea. And every living soul died in the sea. Everything that lived in the sea died. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains. They became blood. There was nowhere to go to get a drink of water. Nothing to drink but blood. And the angel says they're worthy of it because they shed the blood of your prophets and your children and your people so they deserve to drink blood. What a vengeance. How the blood of the martyrs is avenged. Those that cried from under the altar of God in heaven in the previous chapter, How long, O Lord, how long until you avenge our blood upon our enemies? Well, here it is. God kind of stretches it out. He doesn't just kill them off the easy way, quick, some kind of an annihilation or a sudden end. That would have been too good for them, too easy. First, they develop sores all over them. And then they have to drink blood. And then the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And they became scorched with fire. I think maybe some of the way some of these sunbathers bathe and get horrible sunburns that nearly kill them, and sometimes do, with red and blisters all over their bodies, second and third degree burns. It's a little sample of what God's going to do in the last days of his judgment. And he's going to cause the intense heat of the sun to be multiplied, it says in another place, sevenfold, so that men will be scorched with his fire. Is this vengeance enough? Are you getting this, what God is doing to them? Huh? Sores, blood to drink, and scorched with fire. I can hardly imagine hardly any horrible curses any worse or sufferings any worse. And these things that God, these horrible curses and plagues that God pours out upon the wicked and the sinful and the, the fierce and the devilish and fiendish who have persecuted his children and his killed his prophets, including all the self-righteous hypocrites and leaders of religion who have led them astray. Fifth angel in his darkness. How horrible. Here you wicked are, left on the earth, deserted by God and by the righteous Christians who are caught up to heaven to be with Jesus. Deserted to your sufferings and your torments and your tortures and your plagues licking your sores, drinking blood, scorched with fire, and finally in darkness, groping your way around such thick darkness you can't even find your way around. How horrible. So that you gnaw your tongue for pain. And yet, he says, if you're one of those left behind who have rejected Jesus and have refused the love of God, and his mercy extended down through generations and have refused to believe him and have refused to receive him and have insisted on believing the lies of the devil and obeying Satan, this is what you deserve and this is what you're going to get. A horrible, horrible ammo here of the terrors that are going to fall upon you in this final hell on earth. Oh, this is just the beginning. This is only hell you're going to get on earth. Wait till the hell afterward. It's going to be hell here and hell hereafter for you. If you are going to consist on being unrepentant and rebellious against God, as some of you are this very day, this very night, covered with sores, drinking blood, scorched with fire, lost in darkness, Knowing your tongue for pain and blaspheming and cursing God rather than repent. You see, even when mercy was shown to the wicked, 
yet he will not learn righteousness. And then you try judgments and punishment and chastisement, and he still won't repent because his heart is infinitely, wickedly evil. Who can know it? If you don't have Jesus, if you don't have the love of God and the light of Jesus, his truth, and know his way, then you have nothing but darkness and horrors of hell to look forward to. Almost finally, the sixth angel dries up the great river Euphrates to prepare the way for the kings of the east, the armies of the east. We saw in a previous chapter that 200 million horsemen are going to come from the east, summoned together by the devil himself for a last great battle on earth. Trying, imagine, to steal, rebel against God and against his angels of heaven, and trying to uh, still conquer the earth, even in their anger and wickedness and their torment and their pain and their torture, still reviling God cursing God and creating even more destruction in a final horrible war called the battle of that great day of God Almighty in the 14th verse. Summoned together by the evil spirits of Satan himself and the Antichrist and his false prophet. And then Jesus again rewards you, watch out, my coming is a thief in the night. He's speaking to John and to me and you today. You better be ready. You better be ready for the rapture, the resurrection, when it comes, when I first come before this, if you want to escape all this hell. And you're to watch and keep your garments. What garments are these? Is that suit coat and tie you're wearing? Is that lovely dress you're wearing, ladies? Of course not. He's talking about the robes of righteousness. He's talking about the clothing of salvation. Not natural clothing. He says, lest you be found naked. It means lest you be found without his salvation, without his robes of righteousness, without being saved. And Satan and his cohorts gather all mankind together in one grand, final, awful, destructive battle in a place, it's called the battle of the great day of God Almighty in the 14th verse, and then it's called in the 16th verse a place called Armageddon. This literally means the height of Megiddo. Now there's a valley in which I have been south of Haifa, Israel, called the valley of Megiddo or the valley of Esdalon, various names. Valley of the Kishon River. I'll never forget how startled I was as I was riding with some friends there, going out to see one of the ranches and vineyards of that area, which is filled with such vineyards, a beautiful valley today. And there was a sign suddenly that said, Megiddo, so many kilometers. And I was startled. And then I went back and checked my Bible and my Bible map, and for sure, there, only a few miles south of us in that great valley, was Megiddo. And a mound, a large round mound, uh, it's not a mountain, but uh, like a large hill, very round, very odd, very strange, right in the center of that great valley. When Napoleon first saw it, he said, what a place for a battle. When one of the great generals of World War II saw it, he said, what a place for to fight a tactical war. What a strategic place for a battle. Many generals have commented over this particular spot. So strategic. The valley leading from Haifa down to Jerusalem, almost to Jerusalem. Some Bible students have speculated since this is where that final war, the Battle of Armageddon, uh, is going to center and uh, where it's going to concentrate in this final battle between the forces of hell and the wicked on earth and the devil, 
and the forces of heaven coming down, us coming out of heaven with Jesus to conquer and to slaughter them. Some Bible students have uh, conjectured that perhaps this valley is the one he's talking about. It's uh, not 200 miles long, however. But they thought, well, perhaps that's where so much blood is going to be shed as to be four feet deep surrounding the height of Megiddo, there in the valley of Megiddo, between Haifa and Jerusalem. This is where the battle is going to settle. This is where it's going to climax, the Battle of Armageddon. Oh, you've heard of this Battle of Armageddon all your life, haven't you? You've heard of Armageddon. And every new world war, great war that has come, it's been again called Armageddon. But those have only been bare little previews, little samples of the final horror of this final great worst of all wars at the end of the age of man. So then, when he has gathered them together into this valley of Megiddo, surrounding the height of Megiddo, Armageddon, from all over the earth, the seventh angel will pour out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Meaning this is the end. This is the very end, the last scene of this horrible, horrific drama of all the damage that man can possibly do on earth. This is his last horror scene, his last horrific battle. Warfare being man's greatest sport. The war being man's most delightful occupation creating the most possible destruction, man, inhumanity to man. This time, man gathered together under the devil himself to try to fight the forces of God. How foolish, how ridiculous, how presumptuous, how you wonder if the devil can be so dumb as to think he can fight God. Well, he's been doing it for thousands of years, or trying to, so he's still just as dumb, even to the very end. He's still trying to fight. He's made himself king of the world, the god of man, and now he's trying to fight the very forces of heaven coming down. So what does God do as he gathers them all together here in the valley of Megiddo? Remember, the next war, this next horrific war, which is going to be the oil war to put the Antichrist in power, that's not Armageddon either. It may occur in the same place or a lot of it. That's just a prelude to Armageddon. The coming atomic war and all the horrors that man can let loose on the world and destroy a third of the earth is still not going to be as bad as the Battle of Armageddon because this new atomic war is going to occur before the tribulation period, before the Antichrist sets up his kingdom on earth, picks up the pieces and rules and reigns, having come to power over the entire earth by means of this coming, soon coming atomic war. Don't think you're going to get out of it, you church Christians who think that uh, God's going to come along and rescue you out before the tribulation. Well, even if you want to believe that, you're not going to get out before the atomic war because that's going to occur before the tribulation. But this war is even worse. And what's the last horror of this war? lightnings, thunders, a great earthquake, the greatest the earth has ever known. And the cities of this earth divided, and the cities of the nations fallen. Not just one little Greece or Italy or North Africa or here or there, a little isolated one-spot earthquake with just one or maybe a few cities to fall. But the cities of the entire earth are going to fall in this one last horrific shake-up of God, one last gigantic earthquake is going to destroy all these hell houses of satanic power called cities, these horrible cancers on the body politic of man, these cesspools of iniquity man prides himself in and calls his cities. 
God's going to throw them all to the ground. I'll never forget when I saw it in Vigil as the towers fell. Horrible. Terrible. Almost like slow motion as they fell. And God gives the fierceness of his wrath to Babylon. Here you again, speaking of the city, the great world system, the world commercial system, the world money system, banking system, its cities, its buildings, all tied together in the worship of mammon, the worship of wealth, the worship of things, the worship of materialism, the greatest religion of the world, which nearly all men are members of, except the followers of Jesus Christ. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. They're all going to be level in that day. And the islands are going to be just absolutely disappear. And a hail from heaven with each stone weighing over a hundred pounds over a talent's weight. A horrible hail coming down from heaven. Some of us uh, said, well, maybe this is the atom bombs falling. <laughs> no atom bombs were ever going to have such coverage and fall like this. Crushing all the resistance of the devil and his crowd against God and his forces. Great hail from heaven, flatten the cities of the earth, and going to crush the armies of the devil. So ends this horrible wrath of God upon man at the end of the tribulation, at the final rebellion of man, and that in this horrible period of wrath following his great tribulation period, after the saints are with the Lord in heaven. I don't want to be here then, do you? Well, it's bad enough to have to go through the tribulation of man and his horror and his anger and his wrath on earth and the wrath of God combined against us. Thank God we will escape most of that because that's directed at Satan and his forces. The horrors of the tribulation are not directed at us. They are directed as curses of God upon the forces of our enemies. Of course, our enemies' curses and Persecution is directed at us, and we're having a tough enough time with our enemies without the plagues of God and without these horrors of God. But the wrath of God will be visited on the Antichrist and his forces even before we're gone to help protect us from his slaughter. But after we're out and gone, then God just pours it out and forth. Before we're gone, he only uh, kills a third here and slaughters a third there and destroys a third here and there and so on. But after we're gone, it's all wiped out. It's all destroyed, and all the sea's blood, all the water's blood, all those dying and so on. Horrors. We just can hardly even comprehend it. Grasp the horrors that are going to occur after the Lord takes us who are saved, Christians who love Jesus, out of this earth and out of their deadly grasp and their cruel, tormenting hands. God's going to rescue us and take us out. But if you're not one of Jesus' loved ones, one of his children, if you're not a Christian, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, this is the kind of hell on earth you're going to go through. Not only the tribulation period, but then the period of God's wrath that follows it. Plus, hell hereafter. Well, it's not a very bright picture of painting for you sinners, am I? Well, I didn't paint. God did. I just read it. You read it yourself on the Bible. You don't have to take my word for it. Take God's word for it. There it is. There's the picture. Well, next time we're going to study the 17th chapter, and here is one of the most fascinating, interesting chapters. We get a little bit out of all this horror for a while. And this chapter is literally a flashback, just like in a movie. He's going back now to explain to you why all this horror and why these terrible judgments upon the kingdom of the Antichrist and upon Babylon the whore and so on. The Antichrist religion, the worship of idols and material things, wealth and riches. And he goes into this next chapter and explains who she is. If you ask me, her head is the USA the head of the whole world commercial system of which the dollar is the standard. 
but that's just a little flash forward. I'm not going to tell you all about that tonight. But we're going to explain uh, just exactly who this beast is and who this whore is and why God meets out such horrible judgments upon them because he explains it here in the coming chapters. Close the book. We're about to ring the bell. And we're about to snuff the candle on this particular lesson tonight. But what about you? God keeps books in heaven. He has a book of life, a book of the saved. He has a book of your deeds, everything you ever said or did, right or wrong. He has your history all down pat. It's going to be shown to you like a movie one of these days when you have to come face to face, face with the angel of judgment when you die. What are you going to see? Uh, if you have not got Jesus Christ as your Savior and you don't have the love of God in your heart, you can only see death, horror, judgment, and hell. He'll have to read you out of that book all your sins and then close the book. Ring the bell on the end of your life and put out your candle into the horror of hell hereafter because of your wickedness and your sins. It's a terrible, awful picture, Stay. How could a God of love do such horrible things to people? I I'd like to ask you this question in return. How could such horrible people do such terrible things to a God of love and his children of love. You who always are accusing God, particularly the Jews who are, I never met a Jew yet who didn't blame all of his troubles and problems and all of his sufferings on God. How could such horrible people as you sinners treat in such a horrible way, the God of love, the Savior of Jesus. That's the greatest mystery of all to me. I think it's even more understandable that God could see that you deserve such horrible punishments and such horrible fate and such horrible suffering, hell on earth and hell hereafter, that you really deserve it. You earned it. You asked for it in rejecting Jesus Christ and the love of God and even the beauty of God that you've seen here tonight. You deserve it. You know you deserve it. You deserve the worst that God has to offer you for rejecting his love and spitting in the face of his Son and crucifying the Son of God afresh every day by your life and actions and refusing to believe his word and rebelliously, disobediently disobeying him and fighting against him to the very end. You have fought against everything God could possibly do to keep you out of hell. He has done everything he can do. He's tried to stop you every way he can think of. You if you finally get to this hell on earth and hell hereafter, it's because you fought your way there every step of the way over everything God could possibly do to keep you out of hell. You insisted on going to hell. You fought your way to hell. You're determined to go to hell over everything God could possibly do to try to stop you. You deserve it. You asked for it. And you get it. That's what I don't understand. How you could treat a God of love like that, and even yourself like that, and fight your way over every manifestation of God's love to the pit of hell itself. It seems you want hell, and hell you get. May God have mercy on your soul and 
still hope that you repent before you die. This is your last chance. Well, some say there might be an opportunity if you manage to survive into the millennium. Because if you don't, and you die during the tribulation or you die during the wrath of God, you're not going to have another chance much, from what I can see. At least not for quite a while. Hell on earth and hell hereafter. May the Lord have mercy on you and wake you up, shake you up somehow to get you to repent now before it's too late. For when Jesus comes, the earth will shake and hearts will quake. Be ready when Jesus comes, his face will see eternally. Be ready. Has your soul been filled with the fire of his Holy Ghost? Are you saved and ready to meet the Lord of hosts? When Jesus comes, don't hesitate, don't be too late, be ready. And the only way you can be ready is to have Jesus in your heart. Simply believe He's the Son of God, ask Him to come in, believe Him, receive Him, and confess him. That's all there is to it. It's just that simple. Just take Jesus. Believe him. Receive him. And confess him. Before others. Of course you must confess. First of all that you're a sinner. And confess your sins. Or you won't even know you need a savior. If you don't feel like a sinner. And if you don't confess your sins. But once you recognize you're a sinner. And confess your sins. Honestly. That you just can't be good, you can't make it by yourself, then you can receive him and believe on him and receive him and confess him as your Savior and be saved. That's all you have to do. Have you done it? Just remember that. All you have to do to be saved is confess your sins, believe Jesus. Receive Jesus and confess Jesus to others. Tell them about Jesus. I'm sure once you have believed and received him, you'll want to tell everybody about his love and how wonderful he is, how he changed your life and gave you happiness here, heaven here, heaven now, and heaven hereafter. Would you like that? Well, do it now. Take Jesus into your heart right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, help them to receive you. Even right now, just say this little prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Please come into my heart and help me confess you to others. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all you have to do. If you did that right now, even in your heart, he came in because he promised to. If he'd open the door, he would come in. And so he has come in. So now go tell others about him. Tell them how much he loves them too. And try to persuade them to take Jesus too. Amen? You'll be happy if you do. Because no matter what happens here, you'll meet them over there. Your children, your mother, your father, your aunts, your uncles, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors. If you tell them about Jesus and they're saved, you have them forever over there. But if you don't tell them about Jesus, you will be parted from them forever. If you're saved and they're not, and you'll never see them again, at least not for a long, long time, and they'll suffer so. Don't let that happen to your loved ones. Tell them about Jesus now, so you'll have them for eternity, together with him, in heavenly places, heaven on earth, first of all. We'll tell you more about that later. Come back again to our Eden's Revelations Bible studies. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you.
Bye-bye.